Good morning, YouTube. Welcome back to another day in the life of a teacher. I am getting everything set up for our UA time, which if you don't know what UA time is, it's universal access, which I don't know if that's just what my district calls it, if that's what it's always called. Um, I never know if I'm like over explaining things um, that are obvious to everyone that are teachers because it's always called that. But so for those of you who are not teachers or are new teachers or aren't sure what UA is, UA is universal access for the curriculum that we're working on whole group. So we use Wonders whole group. And so it's a time to pull small groups where every student gets to meet with you once a week. And I wanna show you guys what we're working on and then what the rest of the students are working on so that I'm able to do this. Okay, so I have everything laid out on my back table. This is the very first time that we are doing this. The last two weeks, I've walked them through what the spelling is supposed to look like and what the vocab is supposed to look like so that when I'm doing a small group, they already know what to do and they don't have to come interrupt me. So um, while I'm working on a small group, you know what, actually, let me walk you over and show you what the little chart is so you guys can see what the breakdown is. Um, so I'm going to blur out their names so you guys can't see them, so one second. So I got this little template from Miss West Best and basically the groups stay the same. So the groups are always in the same color. I just rotate what they're working on. That way they always know what color their group is and they know what to color to look for. Hopefully that makes it easier so that they are not confused and they can get straight to work. So this is what they'll do on Monday and then see how the activity changed on the top for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday. So basically one group is going to be working on spelling. One group is going to be working on vocab. One group is going to be working on I ready reading. One group is going to be working on a workstation card that I'll show you what those are, but they're from wonders. And then the other group is going to be meeting with me. So every group will get to meet with me once. I have my high group starting on spelling because they haven't been introduced to the spelling pattern yet, but typically those are the kids who don't need a lot of practice with spelling, at least in my experience. So um, I thought that that would be probably better than starting off the kids who have a hard time with like phonics and decoding starting with spelling because they will probably not know what to do um, and they're going to struggle with that and they're not going to be able to recognize that spelling pattern as easily. So I'm going to have them do spelling on Friday right before the spelling test so they'll get a little extra practice um, and then everyone else is just kind of random. Um, so I'm going to show you what they're doing for spelling and vocab and the workstation card. iReady is just a program that they use on their computer and then I'll show you what we're doing for the teacher group as well. Okay, so starting with the workstation card, spelling, and vocab. Vocabulary, they're going to be working on a vocab four square. So they're just going to pick three words from the week. And this typically takes them about, I don't know, eight to ten minutes to do each one because they haven't practiced it very much. So I told them if they finish three, they can turn it around and do the same thing on the back. It's double-sided, but um, to start with, I don't want them to worry about having to do all eight words for the week. So they're just going to pick three. Um, they put the word in the middle. Um, pretty standard Foursquare. They put the definition of the word, which they can use Learner's Dictionary. It is linked on Google Classroom, which is basically like a kid's dictionary for them. And then an antonym and synonym, we've been working for the last three weeks on what those two words mean. Um, they have to draw a picture. And then for the meaningful sentence one, we've talked about in the last couple weeks that you can't just write, like if the word is furiously, that's one of our words this week, you can't just write, he did it furiously or something like that. Like you have to be able to tell what the word means based on your sentence. So you need to probably use the word because to explain the meaning of the word. So um, the first time we did this, the sentences were not so great, but they've gotten better since. Okay, then for spelling, the people who are on spelling will come up and they will grab a dice. And then while we were practicing, I had this projected, but I'm just gonna have the kids who are working on spelling roll a word um, work in the same little area. So basically they take the dice, they roll it, whatever it lands on, so this land on six. So the first word they would write three times. Then for the second word, they'd roll it again, land it on three, so they'd write a synonym for the word and so forth. So that one's really easy. And it kind of mixes up the practice. So they're not just like writing the word three times each or something, it makes it a little bit more exciting. Um, and then this is the workstation card that I pulled because last week the skill that we were working on was main idea and key details. And that came straight from this pack from our Wonders curriculum, which last year I didn't use one single time because everything we did was whole group. I never did a small group for Wonders. So I'm really excited to break these out, but I'm a little nervous that they're not going to know what to do. We didn't do one of these whole group yet, which maybe we should have, but we'll see how it goes today. The group that's on it, I think we'll be able to figure it out. Uh, but basically it tells them everything they need in the little yellow box. So they're gonna need to grab an informational text. I'm gonna show them before we get started where they can find those if they're not sure in our library. Um, they're gonna need index cards and then pencils or pen. And then basically they just follow the directions on the prompt so that they know what to do. Um, so that's what they'll be doing. Also, they have different activities on the back if that one is too hard. Um, the colors correlate to the different colors and wonders with their levels. So 
I'm hoping that they will be able to do that independently so that they don't have to integrate small group. Um, they're usually pretty good about that. And then I'm excited to finally get to break out these little small readers. So the orange is the approaching students, this is on level, and this is beyond. So then I will just be following straight from the Wonders text, the differentiated instruction lesson plan. Um, and today I told you guys I'm going to be working with my approaching level, so I'm just going to be using the quarreling quills, and then these two will be used with the other groups later in the week. So I do one group a day for 30 minutes while the other students are working on that stuff. So I will keep you guys posted on how it goes. Wish me luck with those little workstation cards because I have a feeling it's going to be a little challenging. We'll see. Hello again. It is lunchtime now and I have a couple minutes before the kids come back. So I wanted to share with you guys a couple of the math games that we're doing this week. Um, I think I already shared with you guys or maybe it was in the last vlog. I can't remember. My brain is like so muddled on Mondays. Anyways, um, we are doing a review of time this week. So we started module two last week for Engage New York and we finished up our time portion of it, but the students really struggled with it. Almost all of my class got twos on the last topic quiz. Um, so I decided since the next couple lessons that are on like grams and meters and that kind of stuff is not going to be on the final test. I'm going to just have them work on the Zern portion of those lessons and then I'm going to recover um, time. So this morning we did a ton of work with time and number lines. They're specifically getting confused on when to use what kind of number line. So when to go from zero to 60, when to label it um, like five o'clock to six o'clock. Um, and then if they are given a time, like if they're given like Miss Romeo started working at 5.15 and she finished at 5.50. How many minutes were there? They are always starting at zero. And so we practiced a ton of different word problems today and when to start at zero when you're adding up the minutes and then when to start at a specific time like the problem I just said. So we went over probably like 20 different types of problems and they had to tell me which kind of number line are we using and then they had to show me. So I just had them do that on their desks. Um, and then we played um, one game and then we did one game on Friday, so I wanna share both of those with you guys. I can't remember where the clock game came from, um, but the number line game, I will link down below where those came from because um, there are a ton of games for every single standard. I think they have the same kind of like layout for all the games for all the grades, but the ones I'm gonna link are just for third grade and they're by standard. So um, today we're working on MD.1, so I went and found a game for MD.1 and the kids absolutely loved it. So I'm gonna turn you around and show you what those are. Okay, so the first game I want to show you has two parts to it. Um, they're going to need a spinner, which is going to be for their whole group. So they can play in groups of two or three, and um, each group is going to need one of these. This is the spinner. Um, they're also going to need a paper clip to actually make the spinner. So if you haven't done this before, which last year was my first year that I ever figured this out. So I'm going to try to do this one-handed. Um, they will hold a pencil that I'm going to hold with the tip of my finger that's holding the camera, if I can figure it out. There we go, and then you just flick, and then wherever it lands is the spinner. So that is how you make a little homemade spinner. So each group needs one spinner, one paper clip, and then each person in the group needs a number line, and I just put them in a sheet protector so that they could use them over and over. Um, and the game is called Race to Midnight. So their number line goes from eight o'clock to 12 o'clock, which is great practice for them to be able to see multiple hours on a number line because we've only been practicing from one hour. Um, so for them to see how to split it up with multiple hours was really helpful. Um, pro tip, if you are gonna try this with your class, I did not explain to them beforehand that each tick mark in between was a five minute interval. Um, so they thought that this to this was five minutes, even though it clearly is marked 8.30. So you're gonna wanna be very explicit with them. Um, I had them put their fingers after I realized that they were making a mistake. I said, okay, everyone put your finger on eight o'clock, then put your finger on the first tick mark and say 8.05. And they said 8.05. And then the second one, say 8.10, then 8.15, 8.25, or sorry, 8.20, 8.25, wait. 8.20, 8.25, and 8.30. And then I had them do that all the way up to nine o'clock too, but without me telling them, I wanted them to see if they could do it. And then they were like, oh, that makes a lot more sense. Um, so basically, each player is going to get to spin their little spinner. And there are different increments of time on here, either adding or subtracting time. So. So the first person spins, and I just told them, if you get a negative amount of minutes, the first spin, just spin again, and then anything after that, you can have negative, but if you're at eight o'clock, obviously, you can't go any further back, so just spin again. So they'd spin however many minutes they got. Um, they would start at eight o'clock, they plotted a point, and then they would plot a point at their next amount of minutes, and then so forth, and they were trying to get to 12. 
super fun, super engaging. And then I got to walk around while they were doing this and see who's getting it and who's not. So that was really helpful for me to kind of do like an informal assessment so that I already know for tomorrow who I need to pull back into a small group and explain the number line system again. So. Um, again, I will link this down below. This is a free game. I love it. It's low prep I ended up just putting this in a sheet protector so that they could use these over and over They just used their little expo marker and wrote on top of it and then erased and it was perfect And that way I can just save my games and I'll show you in a second where I keep all of them by module So that was the first game and then I told you guys that we also played a game on Friday with clocks So all this is practicing is being able to read the time on a clock. So we played um, time bingo so the reason that there's three different colors is because the red one is the easiest one the yellow one is a little bit harder and then this one is the hardest okay so the red and the yellow ones are easier because they're only going by five minute increments and then the green one goes up to the one minute mark so um the way that i did this was i just told them um, after we did a lesson this was kind of like our practice for it so i said if you're feeling really confident about it and you feel like you can read any clock i want you to grab a green sheet if you're feeling like you need a little bit more practice for you to have mastery of it i want you to grab a yellow and then if you feel like you're struggling with this and it's really hard i want you to grab a red and then I have all the different times on different colors. So I would just call three times at once. So I would just pull a yellow, a red, and a green each time I was gonna call a time. That way I knew every single student was able to, to be looking for that time on their clock. And no one was just gonna sit there. So I wasn't just calling just green and then just yellow and just red. I was doing all three at once so that everyone was able to play. And then in order for them to be able to put a spot, I just have these little Target dollar spot erasers. Um, I have these in these little Walmart containers that I found last year in the like Tupperware section um, and they're perfect. They fit one whole baggie of erasers. So I just gave each little like pod. So I call like this a pod, that's 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 a pod. So every pod got a thing of erasers and they got to share them. So then when they found the time, they would just put one of their erasers on the time on their bingo sheet. And then of course, if they got, um, you know, a line in a row, then they won. And any student who won got to go spin the wheel to get house points. So I've showed this before in a vlog, but they really like doing it. So say I won, then they would chant my name. They'd be like, Miss Romeo, Miss Romeo, Miss Romeo, like banging on their desk. And then I would get to come up and spin the wheel, whatever it landed on. So it landed on two house points. So then I would add two house points to their little house point tracker on Dojo. So the reason that I wanted to put those in a sheet protector was so that I could save them to use again. So I have all of my games split up by module. So some of them are like games that I've gotten from places like Oriental Trading Company or Really Good Stuff or Lakeshore, things like that. So like this is an array matching game. This one I obviously bought from a store. But then there's other ones in here that I've saved and used over and over like Multiplication Connect 4. So I just have these in sheet protectors and then when we're ready to play them, then I can just pull them out. They're already created. I don't have to worry about printing it every year and it makes it really easy for me. So um, I just keep these in a little drawer behind my desk area so I can just easily grab them. And some of them I don't have very many games for like module three and module six is empty right now because this is the first year that I've started organizing them by drawer. So once we get to those modules, I will, um, either laminate or put the games in a sheet protector or something so that they're easy for me to use next year. So um, I just wanted to share that in case you're looking for a storage system for games. Okay, I also wanted to share with you guys a little bit about what I'm doing with Wonders this week. Every time I post about Wonders in a video or on Instagram, I get a ton of questions about it. I am by no means an expert. This is only my second year using it and last year was a total whirlwind. I feel like I'm getting a little bit better about planning with it this year and kind of knowing um, what to use and what not to use. Um, and I actually have a Tosa coming in to help me with that in two weeks. Um, so I'll share more what she shares with me after that. We're going to kind of get like a planning schedule down so that we're doing the same kind of things every week. But I want to show you what I'm doing this week. So this week, our comprehension strategy is making, confirming, and revising predictions. So before we read the story, our first story on Monday is Anansi learns a lesson. So I have the students do a picture walk. So all they did was look at the pictures and try to get a feel for what's happening in the story to make a prediction about what they think is going to happen. So then I had them on the board, come take a sticky note and finish the sentence stem. I predict, and then they write what they predict is gonna happen because, and then they wrote why they think that based on the pictures. And then 
after that, we listened to the story one time. So the online portion of Wonders has the story with the person that reads it to them. So I just played it for them once without stopping to talk about any of the little sidebar comments on the TE. So they got to hear it one time. So then I had them listen to the story through one time so they could see if their predictions were correct. If their predictions were correct, then they were able to confirm their predictions. If they were not correct, then they were able to revise them. So they would talk to a neighbor and say, my prediction was correct because and say Y, or my prediction was incorrect because I predicted X and Y actually happened. Um, so that's what we did first. Then on the second time that they were listening to it, we were taking notes. So I had them make this chart. So up at the top, um, we put the essential question, why is working together a good way to solve a problem? And then they made this T-chart for text evidence and the explanation of why that answered the question. And then at the end, I was gonna have them put what lesson does the author want us to learn um, and use one piece of text evidence, but we didn't get that far. We actually didn't even get to finish this. We only got... Um, this far these are the notes that we made with students so um, one piece of text evidence they pulled out was that turtle couldn't trick Anansi alone so we asked asked fish to help um, and the explanation of why that answers this question is because he needed help and couldn't do it alone the next piece they pulled out is together the two friends created a clever plan um, and their reasoning for that was that um, the fish couldn't do it by himself they needed to create a plan together because maybe the plan wouldn't have been as strong if he was creating it alone so that is what they were writing for the explanation part. And then tomorrow we're gonna finish this. So we got only to page 105 and I think the story goes to 107, I wanna say. Yeah, 107. So tomorrow we'll do these two pages and see if we can find any more text evidence. This is how I plan. I just kind of like write everything down on this side, highlight it when I get it done. This was the example I created for myself on Friday so that I'd remember what I wanted to take notes with them. Um, and then this is what we actually took the notes on. So. Um, tomorrow, again, we are going to do page 106, 107 and see if we can find any more pieces of text evidence that answer our essential question and then um, explain it. And then we'll talk about um, the lesson. And the reason I included this is because I was looking ahead at the test they're going to take on Friday. And um, the main things that it focuses on are what lesson does the author want you to learn and why. So you have to pick um, a lesson and then there's also a question attached to that that says pick one piece of text evidence that goes with it So um, I'm gonna have them pick the text evidence and then we'll talk about why it does or does not work based on what lesson they chose and then at the end of the story, it has this little make connection box. So um, that was part of our writing for today. I have these little sentence stems up on the board that says turtle and fish work together by, and then Anansi cannot get the berries because, um, and the reason that I wrote these little sentence stems for them was because we work on race writing, which um, the R stands for restate the question, the A stands for answer the question in a complete sentence, the C is cite your evidence, and then the E is explain how your thoughts support the text evidence. So I want them to get familiar with seeing how questions are restated. So as you can see, the make connections part says tell how turtle and fish work together to trick Anansi. So then it says turtle and fish work together by, and then so forth. So we didn't get that far today, but we are gonna get that done tomorrow after we finish our note taking. Um, and I just quickly made these two charts on Friday to try to keep myself on track. Because there are so many pieces and wonders, I feel like it sometimes is really easy to get sidetracked or forget things or, you know, you're kind of flipping through the pages in third grade. It's not set up by day. It's just everything for the week is kind of scattered throughout the pages. Um, so having a visual up for myself so that I can remember what I wanted to cover with them um, just helps me. So, um... I'm trying to think of what else I was going to show you guys. Oh, yeah. Um, so then I shared with you guys previously that um, we are doing parts of the test together. So the first unit, we took off the writing section, which is this. Um, I just printed this out from unit one, week four. So this one has two articles. That's the first one. There's one more. And then there is a writing piece on that. So we took this off of our assessments for unit one and we have been working on these together because starting this week on unit two, they are going to have to do this by themselves. So what I've been working on with them is I have just been printing out the stories and then this little question piece so that we can do it together on paper. They take their highlighter and I teach them that they need to read the question first so that they know what they're looking for while they're reading. So today's question says, use text evidence to help explain 
I'm sorry, use text evidence to explain how barn raisings and Morgan's traffic signal both help to develop towns and cities. And so we talked about without reading the story, you have no context about what barn raisings means or what Morgan's traffic signal is, but we highlighted the important part. We're looking for how both of those things help to develop towns and cities. So we highlighted that. And then we read one story today. So we read stopping traffic, which I thought they were going to think was really boring. It was about how traffic signals were created and how chaotic it used to be without traffic signals. And then this guy, Garrett Morgan, created the first traffic signal and they wanted to see what it looked like. So I showed them a video of what it used to look like and how it used to work. And so it was cool. So anyways, um, getting sidetracked here, we took our highlighter and we read one paragraph at a time. So after each paragraph, we'd stop and say, okay, let's go back to the question that we're gonna be answering at the end. Did that help us answer how barn raisings and Morgan's traffic signal both helped to develop towns and cities? And there was no information actually on this entire first page about that, which was a good thing for us to talk about that sometimes you're gonna read a long piece of text and there's gonna be a whole section that you don't need anything from. Because what they're doing typically on their writing is they're just summarizing. So they're just giving me random facts from the story instead of answering specifically the question that they're given. So we talked about, okay, is there any information here that talks about how they develop cities and towns? No, okay, read the next one. We read it out loud and said, okay, is there any information there? No, 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 no. And then we finally got to the back and there started to be some information here about why there was a need for traffic signals. And so what we did is we just put a little highlighter mark on the side. This was an extra copy, but you can see. We just put a little highlighter mark on the side. And one of my students suggested doing this so that you know that there's possibly some information that you can use there, but we're gonna keep reading to see if there's better text evidence. And so I loved that, we ran with it. So we put a little highlighter on the side so we knew to come back to it. And then we kept reading and most of the information we needed was right here. So that took about 30 minutes to just discuss this question, read through each paragraph and then stop and say, okay, did that have any evidence that we need to answer this question? Yes or no. And then if someone said yes, then we'd say, okay, which piece of evidence? And then they'd point out which piece of evidence they thought. And then we would talk about it as a class and decide, okay, do we think that answers it? Yes or no. So we didn't get super far today. We didn't have a chance to highlight any of this. Um, but tomorrow we're going to come back to this and we're going to highlight the evidence in here that answers it. I might just skip reading the second story and just use the first story to answer the question. I know they need practice using two, but it just takes so much time. So I'm going to think about it because we only have two days where we're doing writing and two days where we do science. And both of those time slots are only about 35 minutes at the end of each day. And so... It's one of those things where it's like that meme where it's like, there's not enough time, there's never enough time. And that's how I feel all the time. In order for them to have like good quality instruction where they're able to actually see what they're supposed to be doing and get practice with it and help and feedback, there is literally not enough time for all of this. So that can be pretty frustrating. But anyways, um, I just kind of want to walk you guys through how I'm breaking this down for them because the expectation is that they can do this by themselves, but they can't at least from what I'm seeing, at least in my district, because this is our second year with curriculum and the class that I have this year, last year was their first year ever having curriculum ever because when we got rid of our old curriculum, they were not in kindergarten yet. So um, last year was their first year ever having like textbooks and workbooks. And so this year is a lot better than last year, um, but it's still pretty challenging. I'm kind of getting off track here, but anywho, so I think I just decided right now we are going to do the second one because there are going to be plenty of times where they are going to need to read two different stories and then be able to synthesize the information into one answer. So I do want to show them how to do that and walk them through the steps so that they can do it on their own. Um, so I'm thinking tomorrow we will quickly finish the story, find the text evidence, and then maybe I'll have students read the second one on their own and see if they can find text evidence for that. And then maybe next week, instead of just rushing through this to try to finish one story and one writing in one week. Maybe we just save this with our text evidence highlighted and then next week on Monday and Tuesday when we have time again for writing, we will talk about how to turn this into an answer that includes both stories with text evidence. So that might not have been super helpful, but I just wanna walk you guys through kind of what we're doing and my thought process through this and kind of wading through 
the Wonders curriculum because as you guys know, if you use Wonders, there is a ton in it. So I hope that that was helpful in some way to you. I just wanna quickly mention, I hope that you guys know that I'm not sharing this to try to be like, look at all these awesome things I'm doing or you know, like this is what you're supposed to be doing or anything like that. I am just sharing my experience as a teacher and hopefully you can get something from that. Hopefully there's something you can gain even if it's like, I definitely don't wanna do the way that she did it. Um, I am just sharing my experience. So I don't ever want anyone to feel like I'm coming on here like thinking I'm an expert or sharing like the best way to do something. Um, you know, maybe sometimes there's ideas that are you're like, wow, that's really cool, I'm gonna use that. And other times maybe it's just helpful to watch teachers kind of wade through a new curriculum and kind of figure it out on camera. So I just wanna point that out because I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea that I'm coming on here thinking that I'm like, the best or an expert or anything because that is so far from the truth. <laughs> so I just know so many of you guys use Wonders too and I know so many of you struggle with it. Um, this is, as I've mentioned, only my second year using it and so I'm definitely struggling less than last year but definitely still on the struggle bus. So I just wanted to share my experience with it and kind of how I'm trying to make it make sense for me and my students and I hope that something in that can be helpful to you. So. On that note, I'm gonna go ahead and get out of here because I am exhausted and I need to go take a nap. Um, but I will probably be picking the camera up again this week, so stay tuned. I will see you soon for another video. Thanks for watching, bye. Hey guys, I know I just told you guys that I was done with today's video, but today is actually Tuesday and I'm not gonna be vlogging again this week because I just have too much going on. Um, so I'm not gonna have enough time to do a whole vlog, but I did wanna share one thing that I just did really quick because I get questions all the time on how to make curriculum fun and engaging and interactive while still teaching what you need to teach and not doing something like completely different. Um, so I did something today with sequencing that I wanted to share with you guys really quick before I ended this vlog. Um, so this goes along perfectly with what I was just talking to you guys about yesterday, which you just saw um, for our wonders stuff. So yesterday we read Anansi Learns a Lesson and then today we were rereading it looking for different things. So um, one of the things that we were supposed to be working on today was sequencing. So instead of just having them practice on a worksheet or something that is boring, um, I wanted them to be a little bit more hands on with it. So I had them get in groups of two and I had them reread the story either by um, just listening to it on the wonders online portion or actually rereading it with a partner um, and then when they were done on their whiteboards which are their desks so on their desks um, they just took their expo marker and they wrote down one two three and four and next to each of those four things they had to write down one part of the story um, and then I had them put for the fourth one the lesson or the moral that the author wanted them to learn because that is also something else that we're working on this week and that's going to be on their test on Friday so I was incorporating two different things that we're working on sequencing and then the lesson or moral so when they were writing down one two three and four I had them start with four so they put what the lesson that the author wanted them them to learn from the story um, and then they're picking the most important parts I had them do this on their desk first because I wanted to be able to correct it and kind of guide them in the right direction um, they struggled a little bit at first because they didn't know what to write and they were writing down every detail so um, if you teach wonders third grade and you're on unit two week one you know that in the story um, there's a spider who plays a trick on the turtle and fish and then they get her back by playing a trick on her. So the way the spider plays a trick on them is she has them go to the bathroom to wash their hands before they eat, and they were supposed to share these bananas, but when they're in the bathroom, she eats all the bananas. So the first time around, a lot of them were writing like every little detail. They were writing like, oh, they, there, there's these bananas, and then they went to the bathroom to wash their hands, and then when they came back, the bananas were gone, so she was tricked. Instead of just, a Nazi plays a trick on spider and fish by eating the bananas, or whatever. So uh, kind of guiding them into condensing down their sequencing. And then after that, they were able to kind of see like, oh, I don't need all the details. I only have room for three details. So I'm gonna kind of condense it down into the big picture of what happened. So then after that, I just cut up a piece of computer paper and put four strips in one bag and each partner got a bag. So once they got their, um, their one, two, three, and four brainstorming on their desk checked by me, then they got the bag and they got to write their one, two, three, and four sequencing pieces on the strips. So then after that, um, the first people that were done, I had them answer those two questions that I shared with you guys about the make connections. So I just had this 
on the board still. So I said, okay, if you finish and you don't have someone to play with yet, then in your writing journal, I want you to finish these questions. So turtle and fish work together by, so you need to write this and then answer it. And then same thing with the second question. So then once um, there was another group that was done and they were able to play, we kind of turned it into a game. So I said, okay, you're gonna take your bag and you're gonna switch with the other group who's done and then see if you can sequence their story correctly. So based on the four strips that they gave you, try to put them in order based on what happened first, next, then, and last. And I told them beforehand, we talked about sequencing words, but I told them not to use any of those words because then it would be too easy and it'd be really obvious what came first, next, then, and last. So they didn't have any sequencing words on there and they loved it. Like they wanted to play every single other person's and there was not one group who did not write the correct summary. So this actually covered more than the two skills I was thinking about because as I'm thinking, they're also summarizing because they have to be able to condense their story into just four parts. Um, so that covered summarizing, sequencing, and figuring out what the lesson or moral of a story was. So in 20, 25 minutes, um, we covered three of the main skills for this week. They loved it. Every single group was on task. And I'm not kidding when I say that because there are times where I try stuff and I'm like, yeah, that didn't work. They were not on task with that. They didn't enjoy it. They didn't get it, but they got this and they loved it. Like literally they were like, this is so fun. I want to do this again. So very simple, low prep, literally just had to cut this up and you don't even have to do this. You could just give them a piece of paper and cut them up. But I had one little smart Alec that said, um, oh, well, we'll be able to figure it out because we'll just trace the cut marks and wherever the cut marks match up to the other cut marks, that was the last one that they cut up. So I was like, I'm gonna cut the papers then. So you might not even have to prep anything. You could just give them the piece of paper and they can cut up themselves. You don't even have to give them the bag. Um, you might wanna give them a bag actually so they can trade easier with another team. So I just wanted to share that because that's one really quick, easy example of how to take something that you have to teach in a curriculum that can be really dry and boring and not fun for the kids and make it a little bit more hands-on and engaging and fun while still teaching the standard that you have to teach. So um, that's all I wanted to share. Now I'm really done and I'm gonna wrap up this vlog and I will see you guys soon.